Hey there, neighbors and naysayers. Clint Finney again, another Eastern Ohio Grazing Council web update. Hey, this is um, going to be the recording of the Eastern Ohio Grazing Council winter meeting held January 27th, 2022 in Caddis, Ohio. And it's our good friend Bob Hendershot on establishing and maintaining pasture diversity. Now, this will be the first part of his presentation. There'll be another video that has the second part of his presentation from that night. So enjoy. We're going to talk about diversity. What kind of diversity do you see in that picture? Any diversity in the livestock? Any diversity in the pasture field? And for most of us, that's what we have. We have one breed, and I'll say probably have one breed of forage in the field. Hopefully, though, most of you are probably better than at least you have more than one breed of forage in your pasture field. You may still have only one. Because like most of us who have small numbers, I bet your calves all come from the same bowl. So there isn't a whole lot of genetic diversity on our farms. <clears throat> what are our pasture fields? What's your neighbor have? I'm not talking to you. What does your neighbor have? What kind of genetics in his pasture field in the forage? I can almost tell you, most of the state is Kentucky 31 tall fescue. Not much genetic diversity there. Okay, same variety. This is my, on my farm, we've got a lot of diversity going on here, different clovers and grasses. Now I thought I was doing a pretty good job when I retired, and we'll get into that. But I wanted to give you the downside. Monocultures will always out yield diverse di uh, ecosystems. Think about that. <clears throat> corn. Do we grow anything in our cornfield but corn? Hmm? Not, <clears throat> not by design. Sometimes you may have other things on that. You don't grow our great great that's great 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 grandfather probably grew pumpkins with his corn. But now, we grow straight corn, because we can manage it. The disadvantage to having a monoculture is it all comes to harvest at one time. If you have Kentucky 31 tall fescue, when do you have the most grass to harvest? 66% 6 of your grass is, done, is grown by June the 20th. So it grows a lot at one time. How about your cows? Do they eat 60% of their needs? And can they? They can't. They gotta have something every single day. And that's one of the advantages of a diverse pasture is we can spread that out. Now, if we're making hay, it may be easier to work in a monoculture or a more simpler mixture. But in a grazing or a pasture field, we like to see more diversity where we can spread that production out over a longer period of time. So we, that's a very narrow window when we get to monocultures or uh, simple or less diverse pasture fields. <clears throat> so we get to this, but what's the advantage of our, some of these single species, like tall fescue? What's the one thing we can do with tall fescue that you can't? Stockpile, that's right, this is in the fall. And we can grow grass and save it. When I started this back in the 80s, I could stockpile grass and graze all winter. Now, as I diversified my pastures, the tall fescue content or percentage has gone down in those pasture fields. It takes more and more acres for me to stockpile to have enough feed to get through. One of the disadvantages of going to diversity. But if you know that ahead of time, you can work around that and understand what to do. But that is what we like this time of the year. You don't have enough snow yet to stop cows from grazing. So we can make it work. On my farm, I live in southern Ohio, we don't get all that snow. <laughs> 
we can strip graze out and get those, in my case, my sheep, I could strip graze and I didn't feed much hay at all 15 years ago. But diverse pastures are more resilient. That's the advantage. Think about it. You know what resilient means? Long lasting. Another word is resistant. They're stronger. They're more resistant. Doesn't mean they still don't have problems, but they can have resistance to some of the things. What are some of your, what's the number one thing that restricts your production on grazing or pasture? Forage production. Water. What? Water. Water. Rain. <clears throat> Drought or lack of moisture is our single limiting factor. Diverse pastures are much more resilient to drought. And if we look at diversity, you can have a single grass pasture. There's a lot of those. I can remember working with Beth out doing the inventories. NRI, pasture inventory. A lot of the pastures we saw were 90% tall fescue. The other 10% were a whole range of things. That her and uh, Gina. Gina would look up and find all the different exotic plants we would plant. <laughs> the simple thing we can do is add a legume to it, to your grass pasture. Complicated or make it a little more diverse is add a four. You know what a four of it is. It's neither a grass or a legume. Well, I would probably call them weeds. <laughs> One of the big forbs I use is chicory, forage chicory now. I like the deep rooted forbs. And they're more vigorous and more drought tolerant as we get to more and more of that diversity because they share water. I want to use this because this was my off of my farm. I measured my yields. <coughs> 2012 was one of those years it was dry. This last year on my farm was almost a mimic of 2012. We had very low water. Yet, see what I did in 2000? Is this got a sticker? There. 2012, 2.7. I yielded almost six tons again this year. With the same amount of water I had in 2012. What's the difference? Resilience. Pasture diversity. Same vine, same soil. Probably even a little better soil than it was uh, nine years ago. But we had more resilience in that pasture field. I could grow more grass with, with less water because some of those deeper rooted plants, and we met it. In 2007 or 12, it looked like this. And I thought it was pretty good. 45% tall fescue, 15% Kentucky blue, 10% orchard, 18% white, 10 red, and 2% forbs. That's a nice looking pasture, isn't it? But 2012, it only yielded 2.7 tons. My pastures now look a more like this. I got trefoil and white and red clovers. I still have some orchard grass, not or yeah, still have the orchard grass, not as much fescue. We've got more other grasses in here. You can see in the background there is, is some warm season grasses in there as well. So we were more diverse, got more yield. But try and stockpile that. It takes a lot more acres for my animals to get enough feed to go through it. Because what happens to legumes this time of the year? And have you got any clover to graze? It's, it's gone. So we, the warm season grasses, what happens to them? As soon as you get a freeze, they're done. My cows have yet to learn how to eat those. Maybe Kevin's buffalo do better. Brown. I think my cows aren't colorblind. They can see the difference. They, don't. they gotta really, really be hungry. 
Now the sheep will come in and strip all the leaves off, but the cows will just walk on by that and not even put their head down. <coughs> so to get back to this, we, we're a lot more resilient with more diversity in our field. Because this is what we have typically, this growth curve. I'll share this with some of my NRCS friends. This is a cool season pasture, but it has legumes in it. If it was a single species pasture, what would it look like? Yes, it would be higher here, much lower here, and if it were, depending on what the grass was, would determine that hump out there. Tall fescue will have a bigger hump. How about orchard grass? That hump would be smaller. Bluegrass, smaller. But we all have this peak right here. So we're looking at diversity in terms of spreading this out. If we're going to use cool season grasses, we probably ought to look at different varieties of cool season grasses. On my farm, one of my short periods is coming up right now. At the end of the stockpile before the my basic pasture starts to grow. So early March is what I'm looking for grass now. <clears throat> so I'm looking at early maturing orchard grass to fill that void to get this to start growing earlier in the year so I can have more grass. If I run out, remember my problem? I'm running out of stockpile. So I'm trying to find something that will peek this in here and get it going. Other things we can use, we can use that stockpile, we can add species, either warm season grasses or some of the legumes to get us to fill in this hump here. Our problem in the winter, it's hard to graze, grow anything this time of the year. So we have to grow some kind of cold tolerant crop in the fall that will help them stretch out. What would be one of those? What? Brassicas. Brassicas, yes. Turnips. Swedes, kale. That will grow into that period. Kale's a good one. It's a little more hardier than, than the turnips grows taller, stands up a little better in the snow that you would have now. So it's a, one of those things we could look at planting into an existing pasture field to extend our, our uh, stockpile into the fall of the years. Multi species, looking at different things. There's warm and cool seasons. There's annuals and perennials of both. And then there's grasses and legumes we've talked about. So those, that's your diversity. Can you get diversity within a single species? Yeah. There's a lot of diversity in, in our grasses, especially. There's late season and early season orchard grass. There's orchard grass that have more leaf. There's all kinds of fescues that can grow different periods of the year. So when I talk about mixing things, we ought to mix the genetics of our grasses up. Many of you are in the, aren't in purebred business. What's one of the big advantages of crossbreeding? Heterosis. So we can look at some of that in our own species of, of grasses and legumes. Legumes are probably isn't as much diversity as there is. The white clover is probably more diverse than the reds. Very little diversity in our alfalfas that we we'll tolerate here. There's a lot of diversity in alfalfa, but it uh, determines a lot on the dormancy. The alfalfa that grows in Georgia right now won't work here in Ohio. Or the alfalfa that they grow in Minnesota or Wisconsin doesn't work very well here as well. It, it goes dormant too quick for us. Uh, yeah. So your minimum, you ought to look at two grasses. I think we ought to look at a sod forming grass and a bunch grass. You know the difference. Sod forming grass and a bunch grass. You also look short and tall. If we plant just straight orchard grass, what happens? 
What's an orchard grass plant known to do? Bunch up. Bunch up. Leaves a lot of voids. So you need a sod forming plant in there. Same in a pasture field. You want taller grasses and shorter grasses to catch as much sunlight as you can. So you want a, a fescue, tall fescue, or an orchard grass, both tall, and then a sod forming grass growing underneath, like a rye grass, a bluegrass, a festolium, a meadow fescue, are all low growing sod forming grasses that would work for you and those types of things. Then we grow the taller grasses more for the volume. Legumes. You need a tall legume and a short legume. If you're going to grow a tall grass, you need a tall le legume to grow with it. What would be a tall legume? Red clover. Red clover. A short legume? White clovers. So, typically, how do we put those into a pasture field? Frost seeding. They work really, really well. Then adding that deep-rooted forb, Helps a lot. You make it out. Do you have a question? If you have questions, please ask. The benefits of the legumes: higher yields, improved quality, nitrogen fixation. I think we're going to have a video on fertilizer prices. Have they gone up? You get cheap. You got a lot of natural gas here, so probably made your nitrogen's all cheap, right? <laughs> Summer growth. They tend to be heat tolerant, so we can get more growth in the summertime. I've used this slide many, many times. It's an old one. We can grow fescue and red clover. Look at the yield by putting six pounds of red clover seed out. If you do nothing, this is what we get. But adding that little bit, how much nitrogen does it take to get there? Probably 200 plus pounds. What's that going to cost? What's it going to cost that for that red clover seed? It's worth the investment to put the red clover out there. Not only do we increase their yield, but we also improve the quality. And we get the diversity that we're looking for, starting down that way. So that we can generate a lot of dollars, and these are low numbers, the bottom of the value anyway of what we can get on that. Also understand there's differences in legumes, or at least in red clovers, in the amount of nitrogen they can produce. Cheap red clover seeds are going to make you a low amount of nitrogen. The newer varieties of red clover that have more, larger leaves, capture more sunshine, and what feeds the bacteria? You all know how Red clover makes nitrogen, right? It's not the plant, is it? It's the bacteria. Who feeds the bacteria on those little nodules on the plant? Where do they get their energy from? Sunlight. Sunlight? Through, through the red clover plant. Yeah. I mean, the, the bacteria, they're in the soil, they're not seeing any sunshine. But the more energy that red clover can make, the more bacteria it can support, the more bacteria that plant's supporting, the more nitrogen it's going to make. And please, please, please always inoculate your, your clovers or buy the pre-inoculated. Don't anticipate you have enough inoculation or bacteria in the soil to get that started. Because that's another thing, there's a lot more genetic improvement in the bacterium, the rhizobia, because the new stuff is a lot more productive than the old stuff. Old bacteria. So they'll generate, they're more efficient, if you will. They can take the same amount of energy from that clover plant and make more nitrogen. So use some of these things. There's other plants we can use. One of the thing, other legumes I've used is Lespedeza. On some of those uh, more difficult spots I have on my farm, lower fertility areas. I like it too because the Lespedeza will grow in the heat of the summer, much more so than the, than the red and white clover. I also like it because it has tannins in it. I'm a shepherd, you know, and those tannins help in parasite control, like the bird's foot trefoil. 
as well. So there's other values of having that diversity into the soil or into the pasture field for our animals, but it also helps into the diversity of the plant and soil life as well. The more different plants you have, the more different kinds of soil life you have. And the more soil life you have, the healthier your soil will be. What yeah. if we hear more about this? Music? It seems like that kind of has fallen out of out of favor. I mean, this is the first time I've heard this talked about in a long time. Korean Lespedes is easier to get. The newer ones that we've talked about 15 years ago, Marion and uh, Legend, are very poor seed producers. So they haven't been uh, beneficial yet or uh, economically beneficial to growing seed. When they can plant soybeans and get so much more dollars per acre, the seed producers aren't willing to invest in the Lespedes crop for seed. So I went to Arkansas to look for, not just to look for Lespedes in Missouri, and I could not find any Marion or Legend out there either. So it's, it's, it, the ones that are grown and have it pre-contracted and sold before they ever harvest. So we won't see it. Now I have been able to get some of the Korean Lespedes, and uh, I like it. I frost seed it just with my red and white clover as well. And it all comes up. You just got to be more patient because you won't see it until July. What's it look like? I mean, is it like an alfalfa or what is it? I mean, I've never know. seen it myself, but real like it. More like a bird's foot trefoil. Yeah. It's a low growing prostrate. The leaf looks more like a trefoil leaf. Uh, it's serrated. I don't know if I have any pictures of it. The color is a flower. The flower is, well, it's hard to see the flower. It's a very small flower, and the seed is embedded right next to the stem. So if you can get it to reseed, it will propagate. We used to have a lot of it. I'm showing my age now. <laughs> we used to grow Lespedes. The quail would love Lespedes of seed. My old, my old friend Bob Evans loved Lespedes. He would spread it every year on his, and that's what, the, and he would always have cubbies of quails down in those valleys in the winter time, because they would feed on that Lespedes seed all winter long. What's your take on the yellow blossom? The yellow blossom, clover, clover, sweet clover. Yeah. It's not the best grazing because there's more stem than leaf. From the production guys. And <coughs> I like to see uh, uh, more leaf than stem. So I, I'm not a big fan of sweet clover. Now if I have a condition where I have lots of compaction, we used a lot of it in the strip mine areas years ago to help condition those soils because it, would, it has a deep penetrating tap root. So if you're using it for that, it's a, it's a beneficial uh, product or a plant. <coughs> To fit a niche. My goal is to get you beyond the need of that because we can grow so many other things that are more productive. I was just like, I thought I remember that was the one of the highest nitrogen pick savers. It's one of the big nitrogen pick savers. That's why we <coughs> used it in a lot of renovation work. So if you're renovating a place, that's a good pioneer species to start with. But if you have an existing pasture field, I probably would not use it. We use it a lot in. Um, cover crops, because it will generate a lot of nitrogen. Now, it's a long growing plant, it has a long growing season, so it doesn't work well as a cover crop, because most crop guys don't want to wait that long, okay? They like to get their crop in the field as soon as they can, so it doesn't work nearly as well. <coughs> so yields, in terms of pounds of beef per acre, we can get more gains by putting those red clovers in there and white clovers as well. And conception rates. Nobody has problems getting cows bred. Do they? Probably one of our biggest reasons for calling cows is they don't get bred. And most of the reason they don't get bred is the fertility issue. Not the cow, but the pasture fields fertility. We don't have enough 
energy in that field? Because it takes energy for to get that cow to ovulate. What's the, one of the last things that happens in the nutrient demand of an animal is reproduction. So if she's not eating enough or doesn't have enough quality as well as quantity, she's not going to conceive as well. So we can put those legumes in there and improve our conception rate. So frost seeding. Now it's time to really start thinking about that. Get your seed ordered, because we're within three weeks. I used to think it was sometime between Valentine's Day and St. Patrick's Day, you ought to have your cross seeding done. So Valentine's Day is how many days away, guys? <laughs> it's the 14th of February. That's <laughs> My wife let me know on the way over. Valentine's Day is coming. So, get your seed spread across the field, but make sure you can find get your seed ordered now. Now's the time to get that stuff, get the seed because you can't plant it. Don't expect to call the guy up. And say I'm going to frost seed tomorrow because he's probably a week away to get you your seed. At the best. Hope y'all enjoyed that first part of Bob Hendershot's presentation and. Be looking for the second part. Uh, they're both about 30 minutes, so we wanted to break them up into two different sections uh, to save y'all time as far as watching it on YouTube. So check out the second part there on our YouTube channel. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.